flintlock smoothbore musket reigned supreme on the battlefield from roughly 1700 to 1855. It was supplanted by the rifled musket, which was an outgrowth of two major developments. The first was percussion priming, which I'll cover in a few minutes. The second was the practical harnessing of rifling for general military use. If you have seen before, a rifled barrel has spiral grooves cut in the bore. The high spots are called lands, and the diameter from the land on one side to the land on the other side is called bore diameter. The diameter from the bottom of the groove on one side to the bottom of the groove on the other side is called groove diameter. The lands cut notches in the side of the bullet, thereby imparting spin. Therefore, the bullet must be groove diameter in order to be spun. But if the bullet is groove diameter, then you can't load it from the muzzle because the bullet won't easily pass through the barrel. In the Kentucky rifle, this was solved by using a ball slightly under bore diameter but held in a cloth patch. This was simply not militarily practical. In the 1830s, a number of methods were tried to circumvent this problem. The most popular and successful was the mini ball. This bullet was made of soft lead and was slightly less than bore diameter for ease and loading. Its base was hollow, and when the propellant gases pushed the bullet forward, they also went into the hollow in the base and expanded the side walls of the bullet into the barrel grooves, thereby engraving the rifling on the bullet and imparting spin. In addition, this also obturated or sealed the powder gases behind the bullet giving a slightly higher muzzle velocity. Grease was placed in the grooves along the side of the bullet, first to ease passage of the bullet down the bore when loading, and secondly to keep the powder fouling in the barrel soft so that the bullet skirts could scrape some of the fouling out from shot to shot. Lastly, the bullet was conical in shape, and though no one was really thinking of it yet, this greatly increased aerodynamic efficiency over the old round ball. Thanks primarily to the spin imparted to the conical projectile, the rifled musket was much more accurate than the smoothbore. I have two demonstration targets here to illustrate this. One was fired with a brown bess, the other with a rifled musket. Both weapons were fired from a rest so as to eliminate as much as possible all variables except the accuracy of the weapon. Five shots were fired at each target from a range of 80 yards. You can see that only two hits were made with the brown bess, while a respectable group was made with the rifled musket. Using the concept of the cone of fire, that is that the size of a group at any range fits within an angle that in turn will define the size of the group at any other range, you can see that all of the rounds from the rifled musket with a radius at 80 yards of three and a half inches would fit on a man's torso out to 240 yards and the probability of a hit out to 350 yards is still quite high. The ignition system was now percussion. Gone was the pan, the frizzen, and the flint. Instead, a nipple was mounted on the side of the weapon and connected to the touch hole. A drawn copper cap with mercury of fulminate in the base was placed upside down over the nipple. When struck by the hammer, the mercury of fulminate exploded, igniting the propelling charge in the barrel. Though not necessarily faster than the flintlock to load, percussion ignition was more reliable and also contributed to the obturation of the powder gases. The obturating effects we have mentioned increased the velocity of the rifled musket from roughly 900 to a bit over 1,000 feet per second. In order to harness the increase in combat range, which resulted from the increase in accuracy, the increase in velocity, and the aerodynamic efficiency of the bullet, the rifled musket was equipped with sights. The front sight 
still served double duty as a bayonet lug. The rear sight, though not fully adjustable, had fold-up leaves which roughly served to compensate for range. The loading procedure for the rifled musket was basically the same as for any smoothbore musket. The soldier pulled a paper cartridge from his ammunition pouch and tore it in half by use of his teeth and hand. Again, this is not a cartridge as you and I understand it in the 20th century, but simply a paper envelope holding a pre-measured amount of powder and the mini ball. After tearing the cartridge in two, the powder was poured down the barrel, the paper then thrown away, and the mini ball placed in the muzzle. The ramrod was withdrawn from under the barrel, used to seat the mini ball down on the powder, and then returned back underneath the barrel. The hammer was then cocked, a percussion cap placed on the nipple, and the weapon was ready to fire. As seen on the range and on this chart, the volume of fire for the rifled musket was roughly the same as the volume for the smoothbore musket. However, the combined battle sight and adjust sight range was nearly seven times as great as that of the smoothbore musket. The rifled musket was the primary weapon for both sides during the war between the states. It was this increase in combat range which had such a terrible effect upon that war. You have probably heard the slogan that the war between the states was a war fought with 20th century weapons and 18th century tactics. This statement is simplistic rubbish. It in fact was a 19th century war fought with a very peculiar set of 19th century problems. The soldier had to remain bolt upright and stationary in order to load his weapon. He had to remain in a tight formation in order to gain a great enough volume of fire to stop a massed enemy charge. But when he stood to load his rifled musket, he became an inviting target for the rifled muskets of the other side. The generals of the day had gained their experience in the Mexican War, which was fought with smoothbore muskets. The new capability of the rifled musket was something they had never experienced. There was some effort to prepare the leaders, but it didn't work out properly. In 1854, a number of competing systems, the mini ball being one of them, were tested in the United States by Colonel Benjamin Huger. His report recommended the adoption of the mini system and was submitted to then Secretary of War Jefferson Davis. To make a long story short, the rifled musket was adopted in 1855, and William Hardee was instructed to modify the drill manuals of the Army in order to account for the new capabilities of the rifled musket. Hardee's solution was to keep the drill basically the same, but by increasing the length of the pace or stride and the number of paces per minute, he had the soldiers cover ground approximately twice as fast as they had under the old drill. Given the emphasis on drill throughout the preceding 150 years, Hardy's new tactics received a great deal of attention and discussion as officers and leaders busied themselves with it. Captain Henry Heff recognized that the greater accuracy of the rifled musket would require different training for the soldier particularly in the field of marksmanship. 
He created an entire marksmanship system to include awards for competency. Though portions of it were adopted, it received relatively little attention. In effect, the leaders were starting off brand new. Some worked on solutions to the paradox of being hit by the enemy's rifled muskets when you attempted to load your own. Tactically, both General Forrest of the Confederate States Army and General Smith of the United States Army came up with solutions that looked remarkably similar to the tactics of fire and maneuver and fire and movement that had been in great vogue in the last 30 or 40 years. Most of the other generals, especially by the end of the war, had learned the value of field entrenchments. In fact, by the end of the war, especially at places like Petersburg, the war between the states resembled the trench warfare of World War I. For example, Robert E. Lee's nickname was the King of Spades. He got this nickname from his insistence that his men dig in, not from any weakness for card playing. During that war, the earliest known written orders to dig in, in order to reduce vulnerability to enemy fire, were issued on the 1st of May, 1863, by General Lee to his forces which held the Union Army in check at Chancellorsville while Jackson's men snuck around their flank. At the Battle of Fredericksburg, Union troops created the concept of dog tags. They wrote their name and address on bits of paper pinned to the back of their shirts, for they knew when they went forward to attack that they weren't coming back. By 1864, there were many recorded instances of veterans simply refusing to attack over open ground in the face of rifled musket fire. By the same token, these veterans needed little urging in order to dig in. In a short period of time, they would have hasty entrenchments such as these at New Hope Church in Georgia. Left for a few days, they would rapidly improve their system of defensive earthworks to include cleared fields of fire and obstacles such as this system at Atlanta. Photographs of the dead of the war between the states, particularly those in the vicinity of Fort Mahone at the siege of Petersburg, support what you saw a few moments ago on the range. The cinder block parapet represented the earthworks. The evidence does suggest that when in defensive earthworks, the soldiers of both sides drew their bayonet, placed it in the ground, and used this as a rest for their ramrod rather than return the ramrod underneath the barrel after every shot. I might add here that you should not assume all generals in the war between the states were fast learners. For example, General Orders Number 36, 7 March of 1864, from General Hood's headquarters, read, in part, the history of the war abundantly proves that they have never repulsed a determined and well-sustained charge. I'm not sure what war General Hood was talking about, but I'm pretty sure about what he might have been smoking. Perhaps General Hood was unbalanced by his loss of an arm and a leg due to war wounds. Hood would later destroy his army by hurling it against Union earthworks in the Franklin-Nashville campaign. Given the very long combat range of the rifled musket, it is obvious that the defense was the stronger form of combat, but the war still had to be won. The North still had to invade and conquer the South. By May of 1864, the North had adopted the strategy of attrition, whereby they would advance on all fronts because they knew they could replace their casualties while the South could not replace theirs. Even though many generals had begun to learn through 1862 and 63 about the power of the rifled musket, in 1864 and 65, both sides, North and South, found their armies locked in titanic struggles where men were consumed in large quantity. 
By the middle of 1865, it was over. The South had been bled to death, not in some war with 20th century weapons and 18th century tactics, but in a 19th century war with a peculiar set of 19th century problems and some serious and intelligent men on both sides trying to find a solution. The final result was probably not what anybody had either foreseen or hoped for.